You know, I know you experienced this because most of you work to deadlines as well, but I'm off to the off to the States, middle of the week. So I really wanted to get all these videos done in good time um, so I could put them up so that you can be listening to them while I'm gallivanting around New Orleans. So, of course, the pressure is on, which means that things screw up. So I already had issues with the last two ones. Anyway, just did a brilliant job on the first slide of this. Stopped it to check it and there was no volume whatsoever. So messed around, messed around, eventually got a little boy in to show me what was wrong with it. And he said, oh, just turn it off and on. So turned off this audio interface thingy and turn it back on again. Now, hopefully it's recording. Anyway, I'm going to talk here about this is the last discussion associated with octahedral and something that you're going to encounter several times over the next couple of years, the so-called yarn teller effect, which has, says any nonlinear molecular system in a degenerate electronic state will be unstable and will undergo distortion to form a system of lower symmetry and lower energy, thereby removing the degeneracy. Um, first of all, what do I mean by degenerate electronic state? We'll think about the molecule we just looked at at the end of the last movie, CrOH2 six times, so hexaaqua chromium 2 plus, which was a high spin D4. So when we put in the high spin D4, we've got the three electrons, no problem in the T2G. And then the fourth electron will, of course, go up in the EG, but it can go in the DZ squared, or it can, of course, go in the DX squared minus Y squared. Two possible electronic states, same energy, thus they are degenerate. And this corresponds to that perfectly octahedral hexaaqua chromium 2. OK, but what we actually find in real life is that it undergoes this distortion, right, to form that system of lower symmetry and lower energy. Now, the distortion is associated with what we have designated the z-axis. OK, so you can either have it extending out these bonds. So in other words, it moves these ligands further away on the z-axis. Well, when it moves those ligands further away on the z-axis, it's going to stabilize anything that has to do with the z-axis. Because, of course, these points that we think of the ligands are destabilizing, first of all, the dz squared big time, but then also destabilizing the dxz and the dyz orbitals. So if we look at the energy levels, what we find is the dyz and dxz will go down a little bit. The dz squared will go down. The dx squared minus y squared will go up because, of course, if there's not the electronic density here, it's going to be more focused around here. So what we've done here is we have moved to a lower symmetry, OK, because we're no longer octahedral. And in knowing that, we've destroyed the degeneracy. We've gone to a lower energy. So there's the three electrons that we had anyway. These two, of course, have gone down a little bit in energy, as we said. And then the fourth electron is definitively in the dz squared, which is lower energy than it was before. So we've got a lower energy system that has lower symmetry. Of course, we didn't actually have to extend these out. We could have contracted those in. That also um, brings us to a lower symmetry, gives us this particular state in which now the dyz and the dxz would have gone up a little bit, but the dx squared minus y squared would have come down because the dz squared would have gone up. So again, we have no degeneracy there because there's no doubt about which four orbitals the four electrons are going to go into. OK, this is generally the one that you're going to see compared to that contracting one. But in theory, either of those could work. OK, it's kind of a, one of those concepts that uh, when you first see it, it might not make a lot of sense, but eventually it will click quite nicely. Now I'm going to go ahead and um, hopefully not jinx things, but check that this thing is recording. Be right back, I hope. I love it when things work. All right, so still on the yarn teller effect, right? Let's do some nice generalizations about it. It's really important for when the degeneracy is in the EG, OK? And the reason for that is because, of course, the EG is the dz squared and the dx squared minus y squared, which are the orbitals that point at the ligands. So because they're the ones that are pointing directly at the ligands, they're the ones going to, going to be more affected when you mess around with the ligands, OK? So we've already seen, of course, the high spin D4. 
where the uh, fourth electron is going to go into the EG, but there's just one electron in the EG, and it can go in either the dz squared or the dx squared minus y squared. And a very common frequent example you see of the high spin D4 is chromium 2 plus. Okay, 2 plus, so one of those lower oxidation states. The lower the oxidation state, more likely it is to be in high spin. We've already seen that when you have water as the ligands, it's going to be high spin. Um, and so, of course, anything further down the spectrochemical series after water is also going to be high spin. Another common one you see is the low spin D7. Again, we've got the one electron in the EG, right? The other six, because it's low spin, are down there in the T2G. So the seventh electron for the low spin D7 goes in the EG. And so again, it can go either in the DZ squared or the DX squared minus Y squared. Often see this for cobalt 2 plus, right? One of the big common oxidation states of cobalt. Um, it says 2 D7, so cobalt 2 plus will just be D7. And then, of course, one of the most familiar ones is D9, right? D9, whether it's that you get, doesn't matter whether you get there by a low spin approach or a high spin approach, D9 is one where you've got one electron in one of the EGs, two electrons in the other EG, so there's the degeneracy. And, of course, you most commonly see this with copper 2 plus, okay? So very, very important in the EG. You will see... The untether effects when the degeneracy is in the T2G, but it's much less important. It's not nearly as significant effect. Having said that, here's a little thought question for you. Which electron configurations will never, ever, ever show yarn teller distortions in octahedral complexes? So in other words, which are the ones where you're not going to have any degeneracy at all? Where there's no choice about what orbitals the electrons go in. Well, the first one is obviously D3, right? D3, the three electrons without any ambiguity, any argument are going to be in the T2G, okay? Next possibility would be where you've got one, two, three electrons in the T2G, four, five electrons in the EG. In other words, one electron in each one. Well, that would be a high spin D5. Next possibility, one I've kind of mentioned already, and that will be where you've got six electrons in the T2G and nothing else. So that would be the low spin D6. Another possibility would be where you've got D8. Regardless of how you get there, D8, there's six electrons in the T2G, so they're filled, no degeneracy there. One electron in each of the EGs, so no ambiguity or degeneracy there. And of course, D10, when everything's filled up, you're not going to have any kind of degeneracy associated with that. All right, so we've just spent a long time talking about octahedral complexes, but of course not all coordination complexes are octahedral. Okay, had quite a considerable break here um, since uh, doing the first two slides in this talk, so hopefully it hasn't been too much of a jump for you. Anyway, looking at some other shapes. First obvious one is if we consider our octahedral, which we've already seen in our yarn teller discussion when we start elongating those axial ligands to give us that tetragonal distortion, that what happens is that we start stabilizing um, anything to do with the z-axis. So the dxz and the dyz stay as degenerate with each other, but they separate off from the dxy. Um, as we start removing these ligands here, well then there's more electron density to start interacting with these square planar um, ligands, with the X and the Y plane ligands. And so the XY goes up a little bit, anything to do with the Z goes down. And we see that same thing for the EGs that split, separating that degeneracy. The DZ squared gets more stable. The DX squared minus Y squared gets less stable. Now the ultimate tetragonal distortion from an octahedron is a square planar geometry. And so if we just take this to its final um, conclusion, removing completely the axial ligands, the ones along the z-axis, that means now that the z's really nice and stable. So the dxz and the dyz go down there. The dz squared is so much more stable that it actually gets more stable than the dxy. And then the dx squared minus y squared is right the way up the top. So you're splitting here is the big one, right? Really, really massive between the dxy and the dx squared minus y squared. So what that means is that most 
D8 complexes in the second and the third row are square planar. This is something we'll come along to later on. If you think first of all, second and third row much more likely to have a big splitting, a big value of the delta oct. Um, well now if you've got a four electrons there, another two, another two, so D8 goes quite nicely in here. Big splitting here um, really gives you a nice stabilization and separation. So second and third row D8s much more likely to be square planar.